Okay, good evening everybody and welcome to this sixth episode of uh, Sancheti Hospital Presents Single Surgery Webinar Series. And we have today with us Dr. Vari Daldaf, who will be speaking on neglected injuries in upper limb. So over to you, Vari. We also have with us uh, Dr. Sujit Umkaran and Dr. Dheera Jatarde as panelists with us for generating discussion. So over to you, Vari, to start the meeting. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Achok Shyam. Uh, uh, I'm very glad to speak on this topic. I'm, I'm going to speak on neglected injuries in the upper limb. We have with us Dr. Sujit and Dr. Dheeraj also who will be joining the discussion in the end. Uh, actually, this topic is pretty vast, but we'll try to make it concise, uh, relevant uh, to our day-to-day -day practice. So basically, uh, I would like to define what, what is neglected. So uh, what we mean by neglected. Uh, sometimes we see uh, injuries which have been treated in a wrong way. Maybe that, that also falls into neglected. Sometimes an injury is completely missed and then the patient turns up later, later on, on to the um, uh, hospital and that also comes in neglected. Sometimes uh, the injuries are not treated in a proper way, in, in, in an inappropriate way. So, so a lot of, uh, you know, things are there which, which fall into the neglected category. So what, what should be the learning objectives of, uh, of this particular talk? I think uh, what a surgeon can miss, that is one thing which is very important. So for example, if we look at this x-ray, if we see an AP view of the x-ray, you can see something is wrong here in the wrist joint, there's a fracture of the scaphoid. But if you if you don't see the lateral view, for example, you're still looking at an AP view, and in the lateral view, you can see there's a complete uh, transscaphoid perilunate dislocation. So getting proper adequate x-rays is very important. Sometimes a surgeon can miss uh, uh, an injury looking at only one particular x-ray. We have to look for some concomitant injuries always. Whenever we see some particular x-ray, for example, if we see an ankle fracture, and then we uh, spontaneously, our mind goes towards the knee that we have to see whether what's wrong in the knee. So sometimes there's a proximal fibula fracture along with the medial malleolus fracture. So some expected injuries are there, which, which are needs to be seen. For example, you see this x-ray, there is a lower end of radius fracture. So if you just get a x-ray of the lower end of the radius done uh, only and you can very well miss what is there is a proximal radius fracture as well. So getting an x-ray as a rule which we have been taught in our post-graduation days that we should get one joint below one joint above and look for that concomitant injuries always. So in this case you can see there's actually an SX low presti kind of an injury that is disruption of the introsious membrane along with distal radius and a proximal radius fracture. So these are sometimes missed, which we see in our practice. Sometimes the treatment is inappropriate. Maybe, you know, patient has been fixed with some implants for some fractures, which is not adequate enough. And then there are subsequent problems because of that. Trash lesions will come to later. There are something known as trash lesions, which, which are usually seen in pediatric population, like rendering any x-ray as a normal x-ray and just, you know, ignoring it completely and then uh, missing out fractures in that. I'll come to that later on. Hand injuries, again, very commonly missed. I'll give you an example. This is a patient who came with an injury to the ring finger and, 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 and went to an orthopedic surgeon and was uh, was was labeled as some normal or some chip kind of a fracture. That's a very common term used some, sometimes. Uh, it exists or not, I don't know, but they call it a chip fracture. You can see an arrow, there's a small fracture, maybe an evolution kind of a fracture seen that it was given some gutter splint or something. And then later on at three weeks, the patient came with stiffness and then you get an x-ray and then you see like this. So this is a uh, dislocation, a PIP joint dorsal dislocation, which classically we see. But if you see this, it was uh, in, in this view, you can, you, you, you'll miss it easily. So whenever we have finger injuries, we have to get a true lateral um, uh, x-ray of that particular finger, which, which is very, very important. And uh, this these injuries can be, you know, uh, diagnosed at proper time and they can be conservatively treated in, in, in that manner. Elbow injury is very notorious. If you get 
if you don't get proper x-rays if you don't look at the proper uh, proper things what you have to see in that particular x-ray you can you can miss out on on very um, uh, common injuries for example if you see at an ap view of this um, uh, you can you can miss out a capitulum fracture so you get to get a proper lateral view and um, you you got to get uh, ct scans further for the evaluation so then you come to something like this 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 is very common an elbow dislocation and most of the time this is treated with with uh, with a reduction and some kind of a cast uh, and then you see you know when you reduce it sometimes you see something like this so this needs to be you know uh, taken care of properly when you see something like this it is you're not just you give a cast or or you give a sling or something and we have to we have to we have to see where this fragment is coming from is it a radial head is it a coronoid process and uh, this definitely makes an elbow unstable and later on at 3 weeks when we start mobilizing there is instability and then uh, there, there there is there is some arthritis and all those things happening so pre diagnosing it at a proper time and fixing this this these particular uh, uh, injuries do need fixation of course because this is a big chunk of an coronoid process anteriorly we'll start off with one of the example uh like this is a 45 year old male patient had a humerus shaft fracture which was treated which went on to good healing but again if you see these x rays are inadequate you you don't see a elbow x ray anywhere and later on this patient at 8 weeks came with with a grossly restricted pronation and supination you know rotational movements in the forearm were grossly restricted so we we at at that point of time we got an x ray done and then there was a comminuted radial head dislocation so a humerus shaft fracture uh, uh, is 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 many a times associated with with uh, uh, a radial head fracture there there has been so this was further treated with a radial head replacement because it was very stiff in uh, pronation and supination was completely res restricted and if we see literature there is literature on is available for every fractures every miss fractures hum how much incidence is there um you know of a radial head fracture along with a humerus shaft fracture so the point i'm trying to make here is that whenever we see some injuries we have to look you know uh, above below clinically is more important because if we examine these patients clinically uh, we cannot we, we most of the times will not miss any of these injuries sometimes they are in lot of pain most of the time i think the problem is when there's a polytrauma when the patient is not stable when he is critical and then that time we are you know we always have a have a have a tendency to, of missing small injuries maybe in the hand or elbow or shoulder so a second skeletal survey is is very very important like we have been taught in our atls programs like primary survey do the resuscitation of the patient make him stable do a primary survey once he is hemodynamically stable a senior person a senior resident a registrar should do a secondary survey who should you know examine the extremities very carefully they may be on ventilator they may be you know not critically ill but then once they are stable they should be examined as a second skeletal survey should be done to look for these injuries and if they are diagnosed on time then uh, they, they 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 will be uh, the problem will not be there so uh, we'll we'll discuss most of the case i, I have put only cases so we'll have all the cases only no lecture uh, no didactic lecture so this high velocity injury as i told you there there is a spinal cord injury paraplegia or a flail chest uh, trauma uh, long bone fracture so most of our focus goes on that and we we tend to miss out the hand elbow injury sometimes especially when we are stabilizing the patient so once the patients are stabilized there are they have to the a second skeletal survey is very very important so just to list out what injuries usually are missed or gets neglected is radial head and neck fractures scaphoid fractures lunate perilunate dislocations montezia fracture dislocations especially in children they are they are they are missed metacarpal fractures are most of the times missed transscaphoid perilunate fracture dislocations are misdiagnosed most of the times cmc joint dislocation then um, shoulder dislocation mostly posterior shoulder dislocation with a gt fracture sometimes they are missed ac joint dislocations are again missed and rash lesions as i told you in pediatric elbow injuries usually 
apart from this, there are many injuries like PIP joint fracture dislocations are missed. Terrible triad of the elbow, you know, is not managed in a proper way and gets neglected. And so these are these are the list of of injuries which usually get gets missed. For example, let's start with an example. A 20 year old, 28 year old male had a road traffic accident and he had a he had an open book pelvis fracture, open tibia fracture, and which was managed and he was stabilized and everything is fine now. And at three months, this patient comes with a deformity like this in the hand. So, and once we get an X-ray done, you can see something like this. So there is there is a dorsal, you know, dorsal dislocation of the metacarpal, uh, metacarpo metacarpal joint basically. So in order to get more information, a CT scan helps a lot in these kind of injuries. So whether how many metacarpals are second, third and fourth, or fifth, all are dislocated, or how many are dislocated, what is the status of the articular cartilage, whether we can be able to reduce it, or we have to fuse it. So it also helps in planning of these injuries, and um, uh, that makes life easy. So you can see that there's a bump, so there's, a, uh, uh, there's a deformity there, and you can see you there is a dislocation. So this, we had to do an open reduction. We had to do some kind of an osteotomy. You can see uh, this uh, is a third, fourth and fifth metacarpal were completely dislocated. The cartilage was not very bad. And this is after the reduction. Then open reduction was done. Multiple K wires fixation was done. So there, there's no other option. You can, you have to go actually long K wires. You have to fix it and then so this particular patient, he did well in, in about three months of time. So again, I will go for one more example is a 40 years male had a road traffic accident. So whenever we have all these road traffic accident, compound fractures, we always, especially this chest injury is there, there there's a uh, hemonemothorax, something like this. So again, this patient had a uh, have been treated elsewhere and then he came with a deformity in the wrist and a very very bad restriction of uh, movement of the uh, wrist joint so his palmar flexion was completely restricted because if you can see this lateral view of the x-ray there's, there's complete posterior tilt so there is um, so what are the problems here basically if you see there, there's a dorsal dislocation and then there is there's shortening, there's an radial styloid fracture is there. So many problems are there if you see and uh, and uh, the restriction of movement is very significant. So if you have to plan it, we have to first see what, what problems are there. So if you see number one, there is a dorsal subluxation of the whole carpus is gone dorsally. The radial height is significantly reduced, which you have to restore in some way or the other. The articular surface is is uh, it's it's a dorsal button kind of a fracture, if you call it, and then it's tilted backwards, which should be in the there should be a normal palmal tilt. You know, there's a dorsal tilt, and the radial styloid is is doubtful whether it's sealed in what position it is. So. Uh, this, this, this is how we, we have to plan and we have to try to correct because we are doing it at, at three months of time. So you have to be ready with bone grafting. You may, you have to correct that tilt, do an osteotomy, maybe through that fracture site and try to restore most of these parameters to get a better function of the wrist joint. So something like this, maybe an osteotomy somewhere like this and then elevate the whole articular surface and restore the normal palmal tilt. So that's what was done actually. So, so an intra-articular kind of an osteotomy was done and the whole thing was reduced. And uh, this was an intra-op images. You can see the, there is fairly uh, decent restoration of the joint, a palmar tilt is there. And these are oblique views. So intraoperatively, CM views are very, very important. Or you, can, you should take both oblique views, actual view also, if possible, and AP lateral, of course, we take, especially when there's a styloid process fracture, whether to see these, joint is completely congruent in all the four views. So this is an AP view, this is a lateral view. And these are two oblique views, uh, supination and pronation oblique views. And you can see the joint looks fairly re uh, restored. And then um, that is how it was uh, fixed. So again, if we go back to that pre-op x-ray and compare it, so there, there, this looks fairly nice alignment now. And uh, there is uh, the radial health, uh, height is restored. Most important is the palmar tilt, which which was blocking his uh, palmar flexion, particularly in this particular case. 
So that has been restored to, to maybe around 8 to 10 degrees of warmer tilt and that uh, the, the dorsal articular fragment has again been uh, restored. So that's how, so he did pretty well. Again, this is his follow up at six months. So <clears throat> that was how uh, planning was done in this case. I think most of the most of us have must have gone through this kind of X-ray. The patient coming at you know three weeks old injury with an X-ray like this in his in her hand. So this was a patient who, who uh, this was operated elsewhere. History of some dislocation, radial hair, elbow dislocation, which has been treated in this particular way, and a K virus in C2 and radial head looks fractured and the joint does not look to be congruous. So probably something is wrong here and the patient will come to you for second opinion or maybe he's also not sure whether this was done correctly or not. So then uh, you you are you have to you have to get a proper imaging and then you get to dig on to the old x-rays which she had and it was an injury something like this. So this was probably a, you can call it a terrible triad. There was a dislocation and there is a radial head fracture. MCL is probably gone because the, there's, there's so much amount of the lateral subluxation of the forearm. So this this definitely is something inadequate, which is which is um, which has been done, and this needs uh, some revision. So then we 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 did some more imaging. You can get oblique views done to see, and CT scan is the best. It is, was completely unstable, and you can see there's this there's this fragment anteriorly. Probably it's it's an anterior capsular avulsion, or it's a piece of coronoid fracture. So all sections of the CT have to be, you know, a detailed reading of the sections should be done, because you every section is very important. Coronal section whether you have to see whether the coronoid is fractured or not, or, or the medial collateral ligament whether there's an avulsion. So in this case there was something like that. Uh, there was a, a community radial head fracture you can see in this particular section and so we had again to plan whether to you know we have to reconstruct it now uh, to do a radial head fixation you have to do a radial head replacement or and medially then how how to go about it medially so pre-operative planning in such injuries is is very very important you have to decide which approach you go whether you start laterally medially then what implants or lateral plus medial you have to do a sequence of surgery what so everything has to be in your mind when you're doing such such uh, fractures implants you have to keep ready if you're planning for fixation radial head fixation maybe you need herbert screws small mini screws or plates anchor sutures pull out sutures you need so everything should be at the at ready and you should be aware that i may be needing these these particular things at this point of this surgery so we did we we had our plan it was completely unstable medial lateral unstable so we did lateral plus medial so initially started off with lateral and lateral you can see there was the radial head was completely comminuted and uh, we did a radial head replacement and then this is the medial approach and you can see medial collateral ligament was completely aval so you you call it a bare medial epicondyle sign where when the attachment over the medial epicondyle is is completely you know rubbed off and it's bare so then that was um, the medial the radial head replacement was done initially laterally and the um, uh, medial collateral ligament was repaired intraoperatively taking live uh, dynamic uh, x-rays on c arm is very very important i think uh, personally i feel that it's very important because you you tend to know how much stable it is you uh, while while fixing the while doing the radial head replacement or uh, when doing an mcl repair we realize that you know the elbow is unstable and 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 you all must have realized that it 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 gets dislocated relocated so many times while while doing this while doing a radial head replacement uh, it pops out and in that that's ha always happening and once you fix the medial side of the medial collateral ligament and then you realize and then you realize you know there is some sort of stability we have achieved and uh, then you better do a, an ex, like a, a live uh, fluoroscopy you can see and then uh, decide do you you can make out that yeah this is fairly stable one more important thing is when we are doing a radial head replacement we before putting in the processes we we can see into the uh, ulna in, in in through the lateral incision whether or no whether whether or not we require to fix an anterior capsular revulsion sometimes we put a small anchor in the ulna and then suture the capsule 
to the uh, to the coronoid process of the ulna in the crater you can put a small screw uh, an uh, anchor suture and then uh, fix which 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 is required in most of the cases which was not done in this because that i i felt that was intact and then that 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 is in this this was the post op x ray uh, immediate so these elbow injuries is is always they are very very notorious i must, i i i can say that because it's very prone for stiffness rsd there are so many problems you you know get to get a good function in a neglected elbow kind of an injury again a 40 years old male this is a 3 weeks old injury and patient is in maybe 130 40 degree of flexion in a plaster like this and now then again you 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 have it's a, it's a big mess you know you 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 don't know what has happened what has been done and what how will you approach and somebody coming up to you in your clinic then you have to evaluate you have to remove that plaster you have to get a better x rays done you have to maybe get a ct scan done see what kind of an injury it was to begin with but if you see this this when we came to know and then this it it was an actually an avulsion of the medial medial condylar revulsion kind of a thing a common flexor uh, 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 epicondyle was was avulsed so you get an oblique views oblique views also gets to some amount of an idea that there is some amount of subluxation happening here of course there will be because the whole medial epicondyle is avulsed a big chunk of muscles are there and so medial instability will be there and then you see further imaging you can see this elbow is completely getting dislocated actually if you just do a varus or a valgus stress and then get your x rays done then you see that there, there, it's completely going out and you you get a ct scan done usually ct scan is better to see to see the uh, fractures not to miss the coronoid fractures especially or any you know occult radial head fractures neck fractures so that was done so in this particular case we 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 had um we plan to go medially because most of the injury looked medially there was medial instability lateral instability was not much so whenever we do all of us know that whenever we do a medial approach we have first thing we have to do is see an ulnar nerve and just isolate the ulnar nerve whether i think even if you are doing any pinning or any mini screws or anything whatever it's better to isolate the ulnar nerve just take it back and then identify that fragment in this case it was a big fragment actually so you can see now this that that fragment was identified the nerve is safely taken back and then you you go ahead and fix it you have to find out where the actual base of that uh, fracture is and you can you can fix it out and it it has a huge muscle attachment so in this case it was fixed with one cannulated cancellous screws and uh, with a good purchase in the posterior cortex and it everything fell into place so this was this was pretty much simple but then it was treated in in some awkward way in too much of flexion and you know unstable situation so once that fragment is back then the everything falls back into into place and then again you can see intraoperatively always as i told you any in elbow injuries it is better that we we do a dynamic uh, you know lateral view uh, we we do x rays we move this um, and see whether it is congruent it is not subluxating or not that is most mo most important so uh, this is another case uh, this is a 47 year old male a fresh injury this time so these all uh, other injuries were old injuries 3 weeks 4 weeks old so this is a fresh injury a patient has come uh, to a casualty with with an injury so this patient came to us with a comminuted lower third of the humerus you can say so um, may, maybe you know uh, initial impression was okay we'll go ahead and you know do a long posterior uh, extra articular plate and interfragmentary screws and fix it but if you see clearly in these two x rays sometimes you know we in these kind of fractures we don't get a ct scan done and we are like okay these are mostly metaphyseal fractures extra articular fractures and and um, no need to do a ct scan we have to do an open reduction anyway so the joint looks all right but again looking at the x rays very carefully if you see this there's something is there 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 whether that's an avulsion there is a so if you go if you again see a lateral view the, there is this this looks to be a capitulum fracture so that was a, so we identified that on x ray and immediately we got a ct scan done and you can see in ct scan in the sagittal section you can clearly see that there was a split and and coronal fracture of the capitulum so again that so we were prepared with the with the plan how to go ahead we know capitulum fixation is very very important in order to you know we have to mobilize this patient early otherwise all the purpose of this doing a major surgery is not not fulfilled 
so we did a posterior approach long uh, reflecting the triceps on one side you can see the radial nerve and uh, sliding the plate putting a couple of inter interfragmentary screws to reduce that fracture and of course we the most important thing again was to put a it, it was a single piece of a capitulum and to put a herbert screw uh, in the capitulum anterior to posterior the most important thing is that direction of the herbert screw should be you know kind of should you have to make it pa pa perpendicular to the fracture line so you can see this this is going from anterior to posterior and you can see this, this uh, ring sign what you call it and you can see that this looks to be a uh, well reduced uh, this thing capitulum and this was the immediate post op x rays looking fairly enough and then this is this is at 4 months this patient is is healed completely and he's having he's having a good function uh, pronosupination so i think uh, putting th putting this case up is is uh, uh, we we concomitant injuries is important like initially we saw a humerus shaft fracture with a radial head fracture so this is a humerus shaft lower third with with a capitulum fracture so whenever we are doing x rays we have to see we have to see carefully so this you can see this capitulum is is healing nicely at 4 months so this is a 55 year old male a fall on an outstretched hand injury typical injury which we see always so there's a comminuted fracture of the dorsal and the distal end of the radius with some dorsal subluxation so it was fixed with multiple k wires looks fairly uh, decent reduction and it was give, there was they have give, they had given a below elbow cast so but when the patient came to us with pain in the elbow joint then when we were seeing his old x rays and then we realized that there is a there is a proximal radial head fracture as well so this was at at 3 weeks post injury that he had we were we were digging up the history and old x rays that why he had pain in the elbow so again this kind of an injury was missed so this is known as an uh, asx low pressure injury or acute longitudinal radio ulnar disruption so uh, they they need to be uh, this can be conserved maybe it is not looking very much displaced even on ct scan so at that point of time because it was already operated for the lower end radius we just converted that cast into an above elbow cast and uh, kept it for four weeks and then you know make it below elbow and started mobilizing the elbow uh, maybe initially at presentation we would have maybe fixed that uh, that that radial head in order to get an early mobilization but it looked reasonably okay in place so this was treated conservatively the radial head so that the, the idea is again concomitant injuries are most of the times missed even even missed by you know orthopedic surgeons uh, so one has to look because lower end radius is a fracture which we see every day in our practice if you are not getting the x rays of the elbow done but at least we should clinically you know examine the elbow see whether there is any tenderness around the elbow joint if there is then better get an x ray done or by default get an x ray of the elbow done if it is possible in your center so 40 years old male fall on an outstretched hand a month ago so he came with a numbness in the hand severe pain night pain nocturnal electroparesthesia grossly restricted wrist movements loss of dexterity and then when we are getting this is x rays done you can see that uh, this is an x ray at the time of his injury right so this uh, had a lunate dislocation so there is a volar lunate dislocation so this was initially missed so he 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 had come to us basically with the symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome so exactly exactly when i examined him initially i thought that this is a carpal tunnel syndrome but then he gave history of uh, trauma and multiple surgeries done uh, because he had some lower limb fractures uh, so then i realized that this can be traumatic and 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 i could feel that bony swelling volarly so uh, this 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 uh, was missed sometimes you know sometimes we miss this maybe this is a pisiform or something so uh, one has to be very careful so this patient presented with carpal tunnel syndrome so we first went dorsally you know re reduced the lunate back into its place um, and then volarly we did a carpal tunnel release because he had very bad carpal tunnel symptoms and it is advisable whenever there is a chronic neglected dislocation of the lunate it's better to do a carpal tunnel release so that they get relief of their Uh, nerve related pain which is there so this was fixed with two k wires one going from scaphoid to lunate another is going from the uh, triculturum to the lunate and that is uh, after k wire removal at 3 months follow up he had a reasonably good 
function of the wrist joint. So <clears throat> uh, again, these injuries uh, uh, are missed. Looking at the X-rays properly uh, is is very very important. I think this is again I, all of us know this a scaphoid fracture, a waste of the scaphoid fracture, get a better ulnar deviation view that you know to see the fracture properly. This particular fracture was again missed. Uh, and then in an other deviation view, it, it, it was better appreciated. So uh, there, there is a lot of literature on how much percentage of scaphoid you know, fractures are missed. And uh, it's, it's probably the commonest fra missed fracture in the upper limb. So if you see this X-ray, if you have an AP view, uh, you, 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 you may say that there is something is wrong there. There is some injury is there, but, but you know, you may not make out what exactly is happening. And then you, see the lateral view and you see that it, it, the, the lunate is dislocated. The carpus is basically dislocated. Lunate is in its place. So it's a very lunate dislocation. So, but better is if you, if you see, you know, you can, you can, you can diagnose it on AP views also. If you make these Gulilas line, all of us know this, that there are three lines. If you see these lines are disrupted, then there is some intercarpal instability or there is some, some disruption. Um, there is some dislocation, subluxation. So, <clears throat> this is how normally they look like, and if they are disrupted, then you you are, you are probably looking at some perilunate dislocation or intercarpal instability as such. So this this is very important. Sometimes we always have only AP views, you know, at first go, and then we may tend to neglect it and say that okay, it's normal, nothing like that. So on an AP view, we can make these imaginary lines in our mind, and then you know uh, see whether everything is normal or not. So scaphoid uh, series of the x-rays is very, very important. A PA view in ulnar deviation, a lateral view, and a semi-pronated oblique view is very, very important. We get a, we get a full, uh, complete uh, profile of the scaphoid. So this is a 35 years old male. It was a four months old trauma. And then you, this, this patient was, he was having a scaphoid fracture. You can see in the distal part of the waist, maybe the distal pole, you can see. So that that was that was fractured. So again, if you we have to plan to fix these uh, these these patients now, there there has to be planning. There has to be proper planning. You can see the distal fragment. You can see the proximal fragment. How it is, you can uh, you can see there's there's a significant DC deformity. The the lunate is tilted backwards, and if you make those angles, scapulunate angle and radioscaphoid angle, so then you can get an idea how much of a DC deformity is there. So there are there are multiple problems if you see at this, and you know getting a good result uh, healing at this uh, in this fracture will be a great achievement. So there's there's a flexion deformity of the scaphoid, there's a DC deformity, there's a big gap in the in the fracture site. So you go ahead do CT scan. You can see you can again see there there's a clear cut fracture line. It's like a pseudo arthrosis kind of a cleft formed, and the proximal fragment along with the scaphoid has gone back like what we call the DC deformity. So again, th these are classical cases where you use a volar approach and you know, go ahead from the front. You can see the fracture there and open up the fracture and then, you know, try to fix the fracture. So this is, this is was a volar approach was done. And you can see that once, once you do an arthrotomy, uh, you, you are directly, you go into the fracture site. So one important tip, while doing this is that you you put two um, k wires one in the proximal fragment and one in the distal fragment so that you can see the picture on the right side so you can joystick the fragment so once you can you you open up the fracture you, because it's it's inflection there's a humpback deformity and there's a flexion deformity what you call it and then you can you you open up the fracture putting two K wires and di distracting it. And then you see the complete profile. And then you will realize that how much defect is there and how much amount of bone graft you'll have to, uh, you, you'll need for fixing this. And uh, that, that's how the, you know, when you joystick the fragments, initially you put two wires and you, you just open up and see how much is the defect. And uh, this is uh, this is a high speed burr. Usually, I think it is always good to use a high speed burr in 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 most of the non union, especially of the long bones, to see whether that that punctate bleeding is there. You have to see the vascularity of the proximal fragment. So this was a distal pole kind of a fracture. So uh, it, the proximal fragment was pretty much vascular and big. And then you plan to do uh, bone grafting. You take an alia crest bone graft and 
uh, usually a wedge shape graft so that it is snugly fit and maybe you can slightly oversize that graft and uh, you just try to put it in, in in that gap and once it is oversized you you hammer it when you see on the right side so it it, it gets snugly fitted you know most maybe some some surgeons even do not use any sort of internal fixation while doing this cortical grafting cortical cancellous graft and it becomes so stable that it does not need any kind of fixation not even k wire or not not a herbert screw people are doing that so that is that is how it should look you know after this and once you take a CRM image at this point of time, then you realize that there's, there's, there's a, the, the length is maintained and there is a cortical graph, which is, which is very much looking decent uh, in the center. And before doing an internal fixation, I always check the stability. So this is before putting any K-wires or Herbert screw, you do a palmar flexion, ulnar flexion, you know, all the movements you try to do and see whether it is stable or not. Because that, if it is stable at this point of time, it's not going to pop out or it's not going to, you know, loosen or something like that. And there's going to be a good sort of union on later on. And this particular one was fixed with a Herbert screw and a and one additional anti-rotation wire you can put, especially in non-unions, we tend to put one more wire, which we remove at three to four weeks. So this you can see later on, uh, there's, there's good healing. You can see there's a, um, the gra gra graft, graft uh, is incorporated pretty well. So as I told you earlier, there is something known as trash lesion. So this basically has been described for pediatric injuries, especially around the elbow. So there are, <clears throat> You know, sometimes we tend to see an X-ray, this is normal, this is So this, uh, these X-rays, uh, uh, we have to, you know, we, have, we should know actually how to diagnose, especially this, this children, there are spices around the elbow, they, it's confusing. And uh, then we, we should know certain things, at least basic things that not to miss at least those injuries or send to a higher center or a better place where they can be, you know, uh, they can be uh, taken care of. So this was again one uh, small girl with, with completely restricted elbow and no supination and treated elsewhere in a plaster. You can see that she's moving her shoulder, not the, not the elbow as such. And when you realize, then you do some x-rays and then you see that basically it, 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 it's a Montagia kind of, it's a radial head dislocation anteriorly. So if you see these, this, this line should actually pass. This is, uh, this is known as a McLaughlin line, which should actually pass through the center of the capitulum in any angle of flexion of the elbow in AP or lateral view. So it always bisects the capitulum. That's a basic thing we all know. So it should go here, but if it is going anteriorly, then the radial head is dislocated and we have to reduce it. Otherwise the pronation supination is flexion even is going to be hampered very, very bad. And once these this heal, then it's very difficult to bring it back. You have to do an ostrotomy of the ulna and, you know, do a deformity correction. Very important thing that is, there's something known as this. This is a Mubarak's line. What, what we call it is, you know, the uh, once we, uh, and our ulna is always a straight bone. So when we make a line along the subcutaneous border of an ulna, they, it should continuously go through the ulna. And this, this, should, this means that there's a, there is an anterior bowing in the ulna, and in, and these are the patients which you know have a radial head dislocation. So the because of the impact, when the impact is more, then the radial head is gets dislocated. So whenever you see a, something like this, so this is um, uh, anteriorly maybe it's subluxated. These these the, these images I've got from Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan, our pediatric ortho, uh, orthopedic surgeon. So this particular case was operated by Dr. Sandeep, and this is how we the the uh, correction of the osteotomy, you know, deformity correction um, was done. A posterior angulation has been created in the ulna so that the radial head will pop back back into its place. And now, if you see that line, it's it's crossing the capitulum. So that's how it looks. So after you do your deformity correction, you can do you can see something like this. So this particular ten years old female was treated somewhere, you know, the, the, with an ulna fracture. Somebody has treated uh, with, in a plaster. There's an ulna fracture. And then later on, he realized that there's some distal end of radius fracture also. And I, But at one month, he felt that it it's, uh, looks acceptable, so continued the plaster. So at two months, then this x-ray was done. And at two months, this is seen. So again, what you see is happening is this is actually, it was a Montagia fracture to begin with. So the radial head was out initially, 
but not getting proper x-rays, getting some x-rays like this, not a true lateral view of the elbow. You can't see an elbow here properly. And then when you see an elbow properly, the radial head is dislocated. And then uh, if you, you see it is remodeled now kind of six months and the radial head is anterior laterally, it's dislocated, the ulna is healed. So this, this, this particular was, uh, was again uh, treated with a, <clears throat> with a one year, this is a one year follow up of very well healed case. Uh, which was done a deformity correction. So again, this is a seven-year-old female. Uh, this is a lateral uh, lateral condyle fracture. Actually, it's a very notorious fracture again because it gets missed uh, in 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 children. So you you uh, you you see something like this, uh, a small hairline kind of a fracture there, but these are treated most of the times in a plaster. And then you realize if you see the sequence of events, it goes into non-union. So this is a clear fracture. This, this is so an internal rotation X-ray, internal oblique X-ray is what is the key to diagnose the lateral, lateral condyle fractures in children. So then you get a clear cut fracture line. If you get a true AP, you may miss it. Lateral also you miss. So internal oblique view, AP view in internal oblique position is, is most important. And then you can see, you can, other ways are to do an MRI or to do an arthrogram intraoperatively. And then you see whether that dye is going into the joint or not. So if it is going into the joint, then you clearly see that the fracture is communicating with the joint. Or the other way of seeing it is what happens to the fracture line, whether it is broad here or it is broad proximally or distally. If it is broadening up distally, that means it is going to displace further. If it is parallel or narrowing out, in the joint, that means probably it is going, it is an inherently stable kind of an injury. So that is about the pediatric this fracture. So I think the take home message from today's this uh, lecture is that we should get adequate x-rays as much as possible. We should not hesitate, to, even if there's a doubt, it's better to get one more view, get an, or get oblique views done when you're in doubt, get a proximal distal joint x-rays done. And I think we should all make it a habit of, of doing proper x-rays. CT and MRI can be done, of course, uh, easily done everywhere now. When, when, you are, when, you are, when you are not sure about, you know, when you know, want to know more information, you, can, you want to have a more information about detail of the fracture, uh, the peculiar anatomy of the fracture, then you get a CT and MRI now. Look for concomitant injuries. I think most of the times what whenever it is missed in our hands or elsewhere or anywhere, it is all about concomitant injuries because they, we our focus goes on any other injury. We treat that and later we realize that we had missed any particular injury, maybe, you know, a lateral end of a clavicle or AC joint dislocation or for that matter, any scaphoid fracture or most of the, these fall on an outstretched hand. We have to look from the wrist to the shoulder joint. Whenever a patient, most of these injuries, elderly especially, they give a history of fall on an outstretched hand. So a quick clinical examination, right, going up to the shoulder, seeing tenderness there, you can easily make out because uh, otherwise patient will may not tell you that there is a pain or swelling in the shoulder because his more focus is on the wrist or elbow. So it's our duty to, you know, see, go to the shoulder and see, do the clinical examination and provide rational treatment at the time of presentation. So all of us know that. I think, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we are on time. So I think Dr. Ashok Sham is, uh, is somewhere around. So do, we have Dr. Dheeraj and uh, Dr. Uh, Sujit is here with us. Uh, Dr. Sujit is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and Dr. G Dheeraj is a trauma surgeon. I think we'll go to Dr. Sujit first. Uh, we, I have discussed uh, some of the cases. Most of them are uh, have been in your unit, that is pediatric orthopedic unit of uh, this Dr. Patwardhan. So you have anything to say? I mean, uh, uh, anything particularly to say about uh, missing this, uh, how to, how to, you know, take care of not missing these pediatric child injuries? Yeah, first of all, thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. That was very crisp and clear um, and excellent case-based discussions on missed uh, upper limb injuries. So especially the way you have shown how not to miss a Montesia by drawing the lines, proper lines like Mubarak's line, as well as that McLaughlin's line and the importance of internal oblique view, not to miss a um, lateral condyle fracture. It was very uh, useful actually. And whenever there is some 
in i mean swollen elbow with apparently looking normal uh, radiograph we sh should have to i mean we should think about some osteochondral fracture around elbow and it's always better to do additional investigations like mri or arthrogram uh, right. yeah that's right so how does an arthrogram help because most of uh, most of us are are actually not much aware about the arthrogram like how does it change your decision making or diagnosis yes. or managing this yeah yeah especially when you see the lateral condyle fracture it's very difficult and, and to and which fractures do you do arthrogram is it only lateral epicondyle or or supracondyle or medial condyle also usually supracondylar fractures doesn't need any arthrogram these fractures uh, i mean we do arthrograms for all suspected intraarticular fractures especially if there is a lateral condyle fracture when is it, when there is a doubt whether it is a stable or unstable fracture like songs type 1 type 2 can be managed with in situ cast whereas type 3 4 5 has to be fixed with in situ kvr or closed reduction and kvr or open reduction in those doubtful cases it's better to do uh, arthrogram when you are in doubt with internal oblique view and when you do an arthrogram if you see the dye leaking out through the fracture site then that means it is unstable then you have to reduce it and put a kvr so it's also important for radial head osteochondral injuries as well as the epicondyle fractures usually when the child is less than 3 years or less than 4 years the medial condyle is completely unossified in those cases if you do an arthrogram which the fracture which appears to be a medial epicondyle fracture is actually big medial condyle fracture so all these fractures will get visualized with an proper elbow arthrogram okay okay that that's a very crisp yeah so <clears throat> dr dheeraj i uh, would you like to add something on uh, uh the neglected injuries or your perspective of uh, on seeing them yes actually i wanted to ask you something sir uh, how will yeah. consult the patient that is the most important part right when, uh, when your patient present to you with some un, uh, missed injury the right. most important part remains how to convey it to patient on or his relatives in both pediatric as well as adult patient so right. just few points from your side how you uh, yeah so i think <clears throat> i think that is the most difficult part of it because eventually some way or the other we managed to treat these patients conservatively or operatively but i think the most difficult part is to uh, counsel the patients so first we have to you know it it is very uh, unusual or bad to say that this has not been treated rightly so that okay. of course it should not be told that this has not been done right or there is something uh, wrong has been done so maybe we have to little bit i can say manipulate in that way that say that there's a, there's, there's something more which is to be needed or uh, the which which will help to uh, you know get you a better function and uh, i think uh, most of the time if our counseling is right we are we 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 are we are, we explain them properly uh, yeah, most 99% of the patients will understand your problem and they will oh. completely agree if we are uh, we we are sure we are confident i think if a surgeon is confident and he is telling that aise aise problem hai this ye lagega aise hoga and i think the relatives read how what is the body language of the surgeon how confident he is and how he, and then they they, they get convinced, convinced if we are not only sure what we have to do i think it's a problem so uh, i think the key is that i mean you know the, diagnosing it on, on the right time and conveying it to that particular patient relatives that that this he will need maybe another surgery and but that will definitely give him this this amount of you know benefit and uh, function in the later life You know, taking consent is very important the elbows are very very uh, bad to have no sometimes you tend to have myositis ossificans or you know operated 3 weeks back and you are going in again, again it, it is sometimes a, a a problem but then doing a proper counseling and you know at the right time if there is myositis or rsd or something we, it's better to wait maybe give indomethacin and then you know delay your surgery at some if, if that is not affecting the um, function in that way one more thing in uh... multiple injured upper limb whenever there is no examination is not also possible you may yeah. think of ultrasonography for rapid evaluation of your nerve integrity or tendon integrity Correct. so that along with whenever you fix your bones your nerves and tendons will also get taken yeah. care of right right one also a point i want to add yeah yeah definitely definitely because now you have you have very good ultrasounds available in 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 yes. uh, most of the hospitals and they can very well pick up you know uh, you can you can do an ultrasound of a nerve whether to see a continuity of a nerve even if there is a contusion or you know 
uh, 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 not a laceration but a contusion of a nerve that can also be picked up <clears throat> that is that is also very important because documenting these you never know when these nerve injuries are going to re recover so telling a patient well in advance they they get satisfied rather than later on they are always that the hand is not moving and all the other things related to nerve another important thing is i think what i missed in is brachial plexus injury brachial yeah. plexus is also which we which is missed you know it's a, such a major injury but then you know, it's missed especially upper trunk if there's a proximal humerus fracture dislocation and then there's an brachial plexus uh, upper trunk injury with that but that is completely missed and later on it is realized that his shoulder and elbow function is zero completely because his hand is decent function and uh, then it is realized that the upper trunk palsy has been missed so we have to be very careful yeah medical legally also in these days yes what are your indications for doing uh, doppler in upper limb cases uh, because we see many times you, on day one there is will perfuse hand uh, obviously palpable pulse but on day two or day three there is decreased pulse and uh, hand gets sign also any special indications or any guidelines for I that think, i think um, um, i think in my personal experience uh, Uh, Sujit can also tell later on that uh, in uh, if you have a good pulse, uh, there is no need to do a uh, Doppler immediately unless there is some shoulder or a clavicular displaced fracture which is which looks very bad on an X-ray. But if there is a palpable pulse, uh, pulse, I think it's 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 okay to wait and see how it goes. In pediatric supracondylar fractures, sometimes they are talking so much about this pink pulse yeah. left hand, pulse pink, and other hands and all those things. So uh, that uh, that even they are not doing probably Dopplers because they assume that if it's a pink and then it is clinical open. examination. So clinical yeah. examination is important, but doing um, uh, I think the day before yesterday only there was a case which the clavicle fracture with some some kind of an arterial injury. So sometimes we, of course we have to document because documentation again is very very important these days. So even if there's slightest of a doubt, I think it's better to document that. Okay. Yeah. It's more. Yeah, perfusion is more important than the pulse. That's what is the norm. So okay. you have to look for the saturation, the waveform in the saturation, the Doppler, of course, whether uh, it is biphasic or triphasic flow, that is more important. As well as whether the limb is warm, um, capillary refill, how it is, all these things should be taken care of. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, sir. I have a doubt. Yeah. So, if there is some brachial plexus injury, when do you want to intervene, and what investigations will you do on day zero or day one? I think. Uh, see, uh, uh, in fresh injuries, uh, in fresh injuries, we we literally don't do any investigation. Be it a global brachial plexus or an upper trunk or a lower trunk, if there's a fresh injury, let the everything settle down. At at four to six weeks is the first investigation which is done. you can do probably i personally i do at 6 weeks 6 weeks you do an emg ncv and an mri of the brachial plexus and see whether it is uh, pre ganglionic or post ganglionic but honestly i'll tell you even clinical examination will tell you better uh, than mri even about pre and post ganglionic if there's a horner syndrome and other things you know it's pre ganglionic and most of the time it's pre ganglionic when there's an avulsion injury so doing an investigation right away you will see nothing you will just see edema and wake you know mri reports with which will be suggesting anything avulsion to edema and all those things but it's better let every soft uh, whole soft tissue everything settle and then go ahead at 6 weeks to an mri uh, an emg ncv and intervention is again very important well if it is not recovering and if it is a global brachial plexus palsy i think waiting till 3 months is okay after 3 months it is any time you should intervene 3 to 6 7 8 months as early as possible is always good and in upper trunk palsy maybe you can wait for 4 to 5 months uh, maybe you know if elbow flexion is not achieved by the end of 4 months it is better to intervene and do some nerve transfer or exploration or whatever is feasible for that patient but i think investigation at 6 weeks and intervention at 3 3 months that is in short yeah yeah yes i think dr ashok sham is here we i think we had a very nice interactive lecture very informative to be crisp basic points all yeah. useful points right 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 especially the importance of secondary survey in a serious ill patient yes. because all our focus will go on to long bones first so we right. tend to miss all the elbow and wrist yeah, injuries yeah, so very nicely shown all the time we are seeing this in polytrauma patients initially and uh, then later on 
you know they come up with some deformities the yeah. importance of proper clinical examination as well as checking the radiographs clearly ap and lateral views like many of your x rays ap view looks absolutely fine but when you properly see the lateral radiograph there is some mistake exactly 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 so we're getting that is why it is you know taught to residents in our institute also every time we are teaching residents that we should uh, we should get proper x rays done get, get that's the important of one joint above and one joint below x rays absolutely absolutely that yes. should be followed that should be followed so dr sham sir is back again yes so thank you varid i think that was excellent session and uh, you guys generated a good discussion <laughs> so and you summarize also very well so that's a great thing about the webinar thank you so thank you uh, we have come to the end of this webinar thank you again everybody and yes sir all panelists see you again next week yes, yes. thank you Bye. Bye. Okay. Yes. Wait, yes. Wait. Outline. Yes. Bye, sir. Bye. Okay. Bye, sir. Bye.